Well, good morning, church family. Morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday, the celebration of the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem and presented himself as the king. Now, as we march with intention this Passion Week, we focus our attention on the cross. So do me a favor and turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. You also need to know that this morning we have the awesome privilege of being able to take the Lord's Supper together. Uh, this is an invitation for anyone who is a born-again believer to participate in a special remembrance, a memorial that we take at the beginning of every month remembering the Lord's death. If on your way in here you, you did not grab elements, okay, uh, and you need them now, if you would lift your hand and deacons will come around and make sure that you have those. Remember that we, we always want to take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, okay? The Lord says to examine ourselves, God's word, examine yourselves so that you do not take the Lord's Supper lightly. You may be here this morning and you are exploring your faith. I want to say to you, welcome. And I want you to know and to understand that, that God is near. God is near. I want to remind you that the entire service, we're going to focus our attention to the cross. The most important events in all of human history and I want to remind you that this is the eternal Son of God who lays down his life willingly. No one takes it from him. He lays it down according to the Father's plan. This morning, we will see Jesus walk up the hill called Golgotha. And he will have two striking encounters. Luke is going to draw our attention to two encounters with the intentionality of a surgeon, God has a profound message for us today. Now, before we get to our passage in Luke, let, let me build for you the context of where we are in the passion narrative because much has already taken place with Jesus that sets our scene this morning. Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane under the cover of darkness. A mob captures him in the middle of the night as if he were a hardened criminal. He endures a series of trials by the high priest and the Sanhedrin that make a mockery of justice. There are a dozen reasons that the trials are illegal and only a sham. Simply put, they have found the man that they wish to put to death, and now they are looking for charges to bring. Jesus is captivatingly silent. His last objection was in the Garden of Gethsemane to his father. And now that he knows that there is no other way, he sits in the silence of the condemned. The same silence that Romans 3.19 says, anyone who does not know Jesus as they stand before the holy judge, their mouth will be shut because they will sit in the silence of the condemned. So hear Jesus like a sheep that is led to the slaughter is silent. They're hurling accusation after accusation. And the final official charge is that he admitted to being the son of God and therefore is the king of the Jews. Ironically, throughout the night and in the morning, the king of kings is mocked as a king. Jesus is taken before Pilate with these charges. But Pilate finds no fault in him. He finds him innocent, as does Herod. 
But the angry mob insists that he be put to death. In an attempt to alleviate the tension, Pilate has Jesus scourged. Without going into the brutal details, he is severely beaten within an inch of his life in hopes of appeasing the crowd. Scrambling for an out, Pilate offers the release of one criminal in celebration of the Jewish feast Passover. And so he finds the very worst criminal that he can, Barabbas, a death row inmate for murder and insurrection, probably the member of a notorious gang, is placed side by side with the only innocent man to ever live, who stands there beaten, bloody, within an inch of his life, and the crowd calls for Barabbas' release. And what shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him, they shout. Listen as we pick up our scene in Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 26. When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him was a large crowd of the people and and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus turned to them and said, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they who do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we gather together this morning as your people around your word, and we long to hear a word from you. Take us there in our mind's eye to your son's final moments before the cross. With intentionality, God, teach us to understand all that took place so that we might understand the gravity and the severity of our sin and yet that your love was greater still. Father, if there is anyone here this morning that does not know you, I pray that they would find that you are near and salvation is near and today is the day of salvation. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Here stands Jesus. As Isaiah 52, 14 says, marred beyond recognition. Pilate has written his name and his sentence on a sign that is carried before him as they make their way to the place of crucifixion. Jesus must now walk the Via Dolorosa, the Latin phrase for the way of suffering, the name of the road, the winding path that Jesus took up into Golgotha. It is a parade of shame to publicly march criminals towards their death. Once the the sentence has been done, as they walk, people would line up along the road and jeer at them. They would curse them. All a deterrent for anyone watching. Son, do not be like this man. Four Roman soldiers surround Jesus with the sign of condemnation that reads, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Recall on the Day of Atonement that the priest would take 
the final goat, the scapegoat, and would declare upon the goat's head all the sins of the people, would consider that goat now accursed, and someone would take and lead that goat out of the city, out of the camp, because he had become accursed. God has planned those details Repeated year after year, all pointing to this very moment. Jesus is given the crossbeam of his cross to carry. The long center pole awaits him atop the hill. But each criminal must carry their own crossbeam, weighing roughly 100 pounds. Now, normally, this would be no problem for a young, healthy Jesus who is strong and in the prime of his life. However, due to the severity of the beatings and the darkest night has left Jesus weak and physically unable. The Romans, of course, refused to carry the cross for Jesus. That would be unthinkable. Utterly shameful. No Roman could be crucified, no matter how vile they were. And so a random bystander named Simon from the crowd is forced to carry Jesus' cross against his wishes. And it would change his life forever. He is forever known as Simon of Cyrene, which is in modern-day Libya. If Simon were an old man, he would look back at this event of his life and tell it like this. Grandpa, tell us again about the day that forever changed your life. Well, I was headed into Jerusalem all the way from Cyrene to celebrate the Passover with your uncle. But there was something different about this year. You see, all the way in, all anyone could talk about was this man named Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah. You know, stories were swirling about the miracles that he performed and the extraordinary way that he taught. But I was skeptical. He didn't look like the Messiah. And I had been warned. I had been warned by the temple priest who absolutely hated him. So I was making my way towards the temple on Friday morning when suddenly I was blocked by this parade. It was him. This Jesus had been sentenced to death. Oh, you should have seen him. They had beaten him within an inch of his life. He was so weak, he staggered and fell multiple times carrying his cross. When suddenly the soldier pointed to me and said, you carry his cross, I refused. That would have made me unclean. Moreover, the shame What was I, an animal? I wasn't a criminal. What did I do? But they threatened me, and I had no choice. And as I reached down, Jesus looked at me, and our eyes locked. Suddenly, time stood still. It was if he knew me completely. It's as if he could stare right into my soul and my heart raced. I saw him in excruciating pain and yet he prayed for those who were killing him. He even took the time to deeply care and have a conversation with the criminal that was crucified right next to him. I began to ask myself, what sort of love is this? Maybe God is like this. And then 
darkness rolled in. At noonday, it it became completely dark and, and the wind began to swirl up and as he died, the earth quaked. And the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom. And that night, that very night, the moon rose blood red. Now seeing all of this, I could not shake it. It would not leave me. I knew, I knew that he was God's Messiah. And that God had placed me there that day to carry his cross. You say, now hold on, preacher. Never heard any of that before, especially in Scripture. How do you know that Simon became a Christian? Well, all three synoptic gospels name Simon personally and tell you where he is from. Now, that is a very specific detail from someone who was from a very far off region who had just come in to town that very day. Additionally, Mark's gospel tells us Simon and the name of his two sons. Mark 15, 21, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, this is an even further personal note. Why would Mark mention this to his audience? Is it because they know who Alexander and Rufus are? Is this the same Rufus that's named at the end of Romans? Is this an indication that the entire family became believers? Probably. Ultimately, we don't know. But personally, I actually think that's a very likely assessment. And if it is, look at the magnificent grace of God in Simon's life. That even while Jesus is marching to his death, In the midst of a hostile, angry crowd, God chose Simon out of the crowd so that he might encounter the Son of God. Look at the nearness of God. A divine appointment so that he would know Jesus. Friend, this small detail is written so that you would know and understand that God is near. That God is near to you as well. Moments that God has planned in your life so that you would come to know him. Come to have faith in Jesus. Moments where the Holy Spirit is drawing you and opening your eyes. And the question is, is will you harden your heart during these moments or will you respond by surrendering to God's moving? And now look at the picture of Simon. While Jesus is staggering up Golgotha, Simon is carrying his cross right behind him. Divine choreography of what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. One cannot help but think of Jesus' own words in Luke 9, 23. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Beloved, as you prepare your hearts this morning for the Lord's Supper, is this the picture of your life? Like Simon, following behind the Lord, carrying the cross. Are there areas that the Spirit is asking you right now to surrender to Him, to trust Him, to lay down your life, your preferences, your wishes for the kingdom of God. Simon isn't the only one mentioned following behind Jesus. Luke also mentions that there is a group of women who are mourning and lamenting. 
Now, due to Jesus' address of them, he calls them daughters of Jerusalem, you are not to understand that they are Jesus' close friends. Rather, that they are similar to professional mourners. Culturally, when someone died, a group of women would show up to your house and cry and wail and lament with you with great production. Now, the purpose of this was to help the family mourn, okay? This was a a cultural practice. Now, we might find it as an an insensitive show, uh, but they did not, because while you're, you're in a culture of mourning, you feel free to, to cry and to wail yourself. Now, apparently, there were groups of women who had concern for those who had been sentenced to death by crucifixion. Now, surely, on, on a normal crucifixion case, that person would walk alone to their death with no one to mourn by their side. And so this well-meaning group of women, they had their ministry to walk behind and to mourn the death of one of God's creation. And so on this day, they follow behind Jesus. Jesus is exhausted, barely able to walk. And yet he turns to these women and compassionately redirects their mourning. Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. You see, Jesus had already wept for Jerusalem in chapter 9, verse 44, and now the women are told to stop mourning for Jesus, rather mourn for yourselves. Why? Because the Jews were rejecting the Son of God. They had rendered their verdict. They did not need a Savior. And after so many times of hardening their heart, eventually God's patience turns to judgment. Did you hear what I said? Eventually, after so many times of hardening your heart, God's patience turns to judgment. To judgment. Had God not, not been patient with his people? Had he not been patient? And yet they rejected prophet after prophet, warning after warning, only to finally reject the Son of God himself. And so here, as Jesus staggers up Golgotha, he is gracious enough to turn to those compassionate mourners and to warn them about the coming judgment upon Jerusalem. The language he uses here is common Old Testament language for the coming judgment of God. And Jesus' words are undoubtedly fulfilled when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. That coming judgment would be some of the worst suffering ever experienced in human history. History records that in April of AD 70, when Jerusalem was filled with with the guests from Passover, so thousands had poured in, that Jerusalem was sieged by Rome. Soon thousands would die by starvation. If anyone tried to escape, they were caught and they were crucified. 500 a day were crucified. The surrounding forest was gone and all the crucified bodies surrounded the city. Picture the horrific scene. And then after four months of laying siege, the Romans did a surprise attack. They took the outer wall, and by August, the temple was up in flames. The Jewish historian Josephus, who was there, wrote, there was no one who could conceive a louder, more terrible shriek than those when the temple burned. Describing the scene, Josephus says you could not see the ground of Jerusalem due to all the dead bodies. 
He estimated over one million Jews died. And almost 100,000 carried off into slavery. You see, truly Jesus' words to the women here are our actual uh, judgment is coming of the Lord. And he is compassionate with his warning to tell them, guys, it is about to get awful. So what are we to make of this picture? Again, Jesus marching towards his death. And he turns to the women behind him and warns them. Please know this. For as much as the cross screams, I love you. It equally says, judgment is coming. Do not be like our culture that says, God does not judge sin. God wants us to to just be happy and to follow all of our desires. He's not upset that we find fulfillment in everything but him. Come on, do, do you really believe in hell? What does the cross say? That Jesus took my hell the full wrath of God that that I could never fully drink if I was given all of eternity. That God hates your sin so much that he laid it upon his son. That you either receive the forgiveness of the cross or you will receive the judgment of the cross. And the gruesomeness of the cross or even the destruction of Jerusalem is nothing compared to an eternity separated from the love of God. Unbeliever, days like today will haunt you for all of eternity if you do not heed the warning of the cross. Today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your heart. When my kids were little, they refused to eat their dinner in a timely manner and they would play incessantly. And so I would start a timer for dinner. Once that timer expired, all food is taken away and there is no dessert. From the day you were born, your total number of of days were set, and a timer was started, and it has been counting down. Your conscience tells you every day that you have sinned and you cannot stand before a holy God. And friend, I beg you, before your timer runs out, hear the warning of the cross. Find forgiveness. You do not have to find judgment. Find forgiveness in the cross of Christ. And as Jesus walked the shameful Via Dolorosa and staggered up the hill called Golgotha, there is one behind him named Simon, a bystander in the crowd traveling in from the country who had a divine encounter, one that screams, God is near, God is near. And Simon will find life and forgiveness in the cross. And he will picture what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. But simultaneously, there will be thousands there that day that will instead receive the judgment of their sin. They will not encounter God like Simon. Even though he's crucified right before their very eyes. Deceived by Satan and blinded by their own pride, they will miss the greatest truth in all all of history, that salvation 
is by God's grace alone. Will you miss it? Turn your attention to the Lord's Supper and I ask for you to take a moment and to prepare the bread. We will take this together in a moment as a family. But I need to give you a few moments to prepare your heart because we never want to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So the Bible says, examine yourself. Beloved, in light of the cross, examine yourself. Surrender again to the magnificent news of Jesus Christ. Remember afresh that his body was broken to forgive your sins. Luke's gospel records that that night that Jesus had taken some bread and given thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now prepare the cup. You know, one of my favorite scenes in the entire Gospels is Luke's account at the the Lord's Supper that night, right? Knowing everything that was about to take place, that he was going to be arrested, that he was going to be scourged, mistrialed, that he was going to be betrayed, denied. That very night, Jesus entered the room and instead of being filled with fear or worry, Luke describes it like like he walked in with a smile on his face and he said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. When I think of that, When I think of the victory and the joy in King Jesus for our salvation, that he was looking forward to the joy on the other side of the cross, can scarcely take it in. So in the next few moments, as you hold that cup, as you remember the new covenant in his blood, I want you to remember the victory that King Jesus gives. That he takes all your sin. And you leave here set free. Completely set free.
And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Would you pray with me? King Jesus, we bow before you and we worship you. This holy week, as we remember afresh and new all that you endured in order to take the wrath for our sin so that we might stand before a holy God forgiven and redeemed, so that you might call us your own, your own sons and daughters. We praise you, Jesus. We worship you. Father, if there is anyone here that does not know you, I pray that they would find you that you are near and that today is the day of salvation. Would they cry out right now and kneel at the foot of the cross and would they find life in the finished work in Jesus' death and resurrection? It is to that end that we pray and that we hope. In Jesus' name, amen.